Well, good evening and welcome to BI 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, taught by the New Covenant College here at the Institute of the New Testament Baptist Church in Dover, Tennessee. We are all the way now on Lesson 12, Lesson 12, uh, depending on how you're uh, taking this class, it's Week 12 for you that are here live with us. And for those of you who are taking this on one of our online modules, I believe by the time we're getting now into the Bible overview section of the course, you're probably already uh, doubling up on some of these lectures. Uh, but we're very excited that you have progressed this far. And uh, we now are going to begin our section on the readership of the Bible. Uh, the readership. So, if you'll remember, uh, when we first set out and established the uh, format of this entire class, we said that we were going to do it under three sections. We looked at the authorship of the Bible, that is, who wrote it, how he wrote it, how he's delivered it to us, and we spent a great uh, number of weeks covering the doctrine of bibliology. And I, I believe that we have produced some content uh, that is very helpful. Uh, I believe that we have been able to lay down a very solid foundation in that area uh, that is something that really is, is kind of groundbreaking in a lot of ways because of the uh, bibliology and the doctrine of providential preservation that we were able to cover in those 10 weeks. And so I commend those lectures to you and pray that they are indeed a blessing. And then the last time we met together, we covered the, um, the readers of the Bible. Uh, uh, that's actually incorrect. Look at that. We covered the readership of the Bible in our last section where we looked at hermeneutics and we looked at... Uh, and we looked at principles of interpretation. And so with this lecture, we're going to actually begin the contents of the Bible. And this is where we'll be, the contents of the Bible, uh, is where we'll be for the remainder of this course. We're going to be looking at what the Bible actually contains. Now, uh, those of you who are in your first year of uh, college, uh, studying for a theological or biblical education, you'll no doubt take... Uh, Old Testament survey, New Testament survey, and then later on when you get a little bit later, maybe even in your graduate studies, you'll take Old Testament introduction and New Testament introduction. Well, this is a crash course and primer for those courses, okay? What we're going to do in a very short amount of time is give you an overview of uh, the uh, whole of Scripture. So this will be very uh, helpful for you. I believe there's many benefits that come from such a study, just like in your personal reading. You get blessed when you slow down and take your time and maybe you spend a, a whole afternoon reading one chapter of Scripture and mulling it over and searching it out and you get something from it by reading it that way. But then you also get something when you read your Bible and you sit down and you read a whole book and you read it in an hour and you just consume it. You know um, that you, you see things in both ways that you don't see when you read it in that particular manner. So what we're going to do is not get bogged down in a lot of the details and a lot of the nuances, but we are going to start in Genesis and end in Revelation. We're going to go all the way through the Bible. Now, uh, I remember when I took courses like these in college, uh, we would oftentimes begin in Genesis for Old Testament survey and if the Lord was really good to us, we might be in 2 Kings at the end of the semester, and then our last class would be speeding through the rest of the Old Testament. Well, we don't want to do that. I'm, I'm going to do my best to be diligent with uh, covering all of the material that we need to cover in the time that we have so that we can spend uh, an, a just and fair amount of time on the different portions of Scripture. These lectures will be shorter than those in our bibliology section, uh, but they are accompanied by the assigned reading that you will find in your syllabus. Those articles there that are linked, if you have the official New Covenant College syllabus, you'll be able to find those. Make sure that you're reading them, and uh, make sure that you're reading them as we're studying these books. So don't go in and read all those lectures in, in one sitting, but as we're studying the Pentateuch, read the lecture on the Pentateuch. As we're studying the historical books, read the article in the historical books, so on and so forth. So... Uh, let's get into our content tonight. We're going to begin with an overview of the Pentateuch. Overview of the Pentateuch. Now, I always get confused when writing the word Pentateuch because of the word Pentecost. And the word Pentecost uh, has an E there after the T. 
Pentecost, but Pentateuch has an A, and I always get those messed up. Uh, but the Pentateuch encompasses the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And uh, you must understand the, the entire Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament, right, the Tanakh, uh, was divided into three parts. That's how the Hebrews divided their Bible, into three parts. The Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. And we see this division utilized in the New Testament ministry of Jesus and His Apostles. However, in our English Bible, the books are identical, but the order is different. And so it makes a little bit more sense for us to divide the Old Testament in four divisions. Four divisions. And this is the, the uh, layout that we're going to be using in our overview class. So the four divisions of the Old Testament that we're going to be using are the Pentateuch, the Old Testament historical books, the poetical books, and the prophetical books. And tonight... We're going to be looking at the Pentateuch. So uh, the first thing we want to consider is just the name, the authorship, and the dating of the Pentateuch. Uh, the Pentateuch gets its name from a Greek word meaning five scrolls. So you see that penta there, and then tuch, uh, we're, we're talking about five scrolls or five books. And it corresponds with the section of the Hebrew Bible labeled as the law. The law, prophets, and writings, the law was the Pentateuch or the Torah. You're probably familiar with that term there. Moses is the author of the Pentateuch. He wrote all of the books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, this is confirmed by the Pentateuch itself. There's ample uh, places in the Pentateuch where Moses claims that he is the author. And it's also confirmed by the testimony of the New Testament. Jesus will sometimes just refer to as Moses said or as was in the writings of Moses, right? Um, we must understand also that no portion of the Old Testament has been under more critical scrutiny concerning its authorship and origin than the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the most debated section of the Old Testament. Now, why might that be? Well, because it's the first section. It's the section that lays the bedrock for the rest of the Old Testament. And so there's a variety of liberal theories uh, concerning alternative views of the authorship of the Pentateuch. We don't have time to get into all of those, but uh, a lot of higher critical scholars, uh, a lot of them coming from Germany, uh, such as the Wellhausen theory hypothesis, the hypothesis theory of the authorship of the Pentateuch, suggests that there were different authors for different portions and they were written at a much later date and so on and so forth. But these are all, as I said, liberal theories on the authorship of the Pentateuch. Uh, but we, we must understand and we must confess, as the Bible plainly teaches, that the Pentateuch was written by Moses. Now, when it comes to dating the Pentateuch, that is, when was it written, because of the Mosaic authorship, in order to date the Pentateuch, we must first date the life of Moses. Okay, uh, The dating of Moses' life, there's one very key piece of information in the Bible that's necessary for dating the life of Moses, because the life of Moses is inseparably linked to that monumental event of the Exodus, of the Exodus. So, uh, in 1 Kings 6, 1, we have a, uh, a, a very important clue as to when the Pentateuch was written. In 1 Kings 6, 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. So it says that uh, the exodus, that, that is when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, was in the 480th year, uh, Solomon's fourth year was in the 480th year after the exodus. So the dates of Solomon are relatively undisputed. Solomon reigned as king from around 970 uh, to 931 B.C. Those were the 40 years of Solomon's reign there. And um, we know that if we just count back 480 years, I bet you didn't think you'd have to do math uh, getting a Bible degree, but you were wrong 
but if we count back 480 years, this would place the Exodus around the mid-15th century. Okay, so uh, the Pentateuch was written by Moses Mosaic authorship, and we're looking at the mid-15th century. Uh, so we're just going to say um, 480 years, 930. We're just going to say circa uh, 1440 B.C. So uh, 1400 years before the coming of Christ uh, is about when the Pentateuch was written. It's very important for you to know. Uh, let's look at the theological and biblical significance of the books called the Pentateuch. Well, what the four Gospels are to the New Testament, the Pentateuch is to the Old Testament. The Pentateuch lays the foundation for the entire Old Testament and, by extension, the whole of Scripture. It records the theological and historical foundation upon which the complete narrative of the Bible is based. The rest of the Bible is a continuation of God's gracious revelation of Himself that began in Eden. It was in Eden that God began to reveal Himself to mankind. And we find that account in the Pentateuch. And the rest of the Bible is just a continuation of God revealing Himself to men. And this is the reason for the intense scrutiny of the Pentateuch. If you can wipe away the foundation, if you can bring the Pentateuch unto question, the authority and veracity of the rest of the Bible crumbles. So this is why we must affirm and defend the Mosaic authorship and the historicity of the Pentateuch. What about the redemptive significance of the Pentateuch? Remember our second hermeneutical uh, rule and principle was that we view the Bible from a covenantal and redemptive perspective. So as you read the Pentateuch, uh, you may think that it sounds a bit outdated or obsolete for the modern day Christian. And yes, it's true that there are particulars within the Pentateuch, such as the customs of their day and laws that were designed for their specific environment that don't apply to us in the same way that it applied to the original audience. We must understand that these examples are still applicable to us, just perhaps in a different manner. So when you're reading about bloody sacrifices, if you're understanding that properly, if you have proper hermeneutics, well, you're not going to go out and slay a fatted calf or kill a goat, but you are going to look to our true bloody sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Pentateuch is very applicable to the New Testament Christian. You must remember that there is only one gospel. There's only one gospel. The gospel of Moses is the gospel of the Apostle Paul. And from the garden to the end of this age, the substance of the gospel has never changed. What does change are the outward manifestations of the message. How we perceive the gospel, the symbols that we use, we no longer observe the Hebrew feasts, but we have the Lord's Supper. The outward manifestations change, but the substance of the message remains the same. And we must read the Pentateuch through the lens of Christ and seek to understand how the types and shadows of the Pentateuch point to the Lord Jesus and our salvation in Him. The Pentateuch first introduces God's plan of redemption through historical narrative. When Adam fell in the garden, the very first thing God did was slay an animal as an act of mercy, and he clothed them. Do you see the symbology in that? Do you see the pictures in that? And then God announced a glorious promise of redemption in Genesis 3 and verse 15, which we call the Proto-Evangelium. And in that, God promised that he would send the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. And this is the first pronouncement of God's plan to redeem a people from Adam's fallen race. And the rest of the Bible is the unfolding of this singular plan. It's the scarlet thread that binds the scriptures together. In the Pentateuch, we see introductions to doctrines such as God's divine sovereignty. 
God's providence, the fall of man, God's demand for holiness, and salvation by grace through faith in the promises of God. We also see the principle of God's covenantal dealing with His people. God is a God who enters into covenants with mankind through a mediator. So, uh, because of the Mosaic authorship, these books share a similar dating and a similar context. But now let's briefly look at the individual books of the Pentateuch. So the first book, the book of Genesis. Uh, the name, and I'll write these books up here as we go along. Let's put them right here. So we got Genesis first. I would encourage you very strongly as you're taking this course to memorize the books of the Bible in their order, the 66 books of the Bible. It's very important uh, for you to be able to know that. Uh, you never know when that knowledge might be needed. So um, try to do that if you would. Uh, the name of the book of Genesis comes from the Septuagint, which as you know is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. We talked about that briefly in our bibliology section. And it comes from a Greek word that means beginning beginning. Genesis. You, you know, we have the English word generate, right? It's uh, to, to start something, right? Some major themes in the book of Genesis. Well, as the title implies, it is the book of beginnings. We see a lot of firsts in Genesis. I believe uh, A.W. Pink, in his book, Gleanings in Genesis, had a whole list of seed doctrines that we find in Genesis that we see developed later in the Bible. In Genesis, God is revealed as creator, God is revealed as creator. Genesis records the literal history of Adam's race and the origins of the nation of Israel. The book of Genesis is not like other religious texts from the ancient Near East, which contains myths and uh, all kinds of supernatural legends and stories. But the book of Genesis presents itself, and it is a straightforward, factual, historical narrative. In the book of Genesis, God enters into covenant with mankind. He has a relationship with the creature. And for these reasons, it is to be interpreted, Genesis, as a literal narrative, not as poetry, as some have suggested, not as an allegory, as some try to make the days of creation out to be. Uh, but it is not a symbolic book at all, but it is a literal book. Some key events in the book of Genesis, of course, the account of creation, the Noahic Flood, the Tower of Babel, the calling of Abraham, the family of Israel migrating to Egypt. That's all in the book of Genesis. Isn't it interesting how all of those events are major pillars of the Bible? And they all take place there in the book of Genesis. Some important characters, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And most of these characters, not all of them, are pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in some way. Of course, uh, one of the prominent uh, pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in Genesis that I didn't name. Anybody want to take a crack at it? He was a prophet, priest, and king. Melchizedek, yes. Melchizedek in the book of Genesis, uh, who is, a, is really just a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ if you have time to study out Melchizedek. Nobody knows where he came from. Uh, he had a miraculous beginning. He was a, he was a king of Salem, right? So, uh, and a priest and a prophet of the true and living God. So, interesting how that uh, typology is in our Bible. Uh, the outline for the book of Genesis. One, the creation and the fall. That is from chapter 1 through chapter 11. Two, God's covenant with Abraham and his seed. That is chapters 12 through 36. Three, the history of Joseph and Israel in Egypt, chapters 37 through 50. Uh, the first several chapters of Genesis, really the first half of the book, so to speak, uh, covers many, many, many years of history, centuries of history. And then the last chapters cover the lifetime of one individual. And we see that principle in the Bible as God narrows down in Genesis and uh, he begins to focus more in depth and more in depth as the, the different characters develop within the book. All right, secondly, we have the book of Exodus. Exodus. Exodus also takes its name from the Septuagint, and uh, it means the exit. 
And we, I think you can see there, I don't have to explain that one to you, how we get that word down into our English language. Some major themes of the book of Exodus include redemption and deliverance. Exodus is a book of redemption and deliverance. The giving of the law on Mount Sinai. The holiness of God as seen in his law. The holiness of God is a very prominent theme in Exodus. The faithfulness of God in keeping his covenant with lawbreakers. We have the establishment of the standards God requires of his covenant people to dwell with him. We can't just enter into the presence of God and have a relationship with him on any way we please, but we must do so on God's terms. And that's what God's people learn in the book of Exodus. We see the sheer disdain that God has for idolatry. And we see the establishment of the priestly mediator as a type of Christ. Some key events in the book of Exodus include the Passover, the crossing of the Red Sea, and the giving of the law, as we said, and the establishment of the Mosaic Covenant. Establishment of the Mosaic Covenant. Important characters there in the book of Exodus include Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh. There's others, of course, uh, that enter into the narrative. Now, let me give you an outline for the book of Exodus. One, God delivers Israel from Egypt. That's chapters 1 through 18. Two, God makes Israel his people. That's chapters 19 through 40. Uh, that is the uh, very simple and straightforward outline of the book of Exodus. Uh, it's, it's basically divided into the section of where which uh, they are leaving Egypt, let my people go, as Moses said, and then once they get out of Egypt, we see their dwellings at Mount Sinai there uh, as God makes them his people. So he delivers them and then begins to sanctify them. That's the, the picture there in Exodus. Thirdly, in the Pentateuch, we have the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. And this uh, name comes from a word uh, that means pertaining to the Levites. Pertaining to the Levites. So major themes in Leviticus, again, the holiness of God. Uh, teachings on how God must be worshipped. Now, you wouldn't think that uh, we would find very many teachings on the worship of God in an Old Testament book like Leviticus. And surely there's a lot of particulars that wouldn't apply, right? We don't have that tabernacle, temple worship anymore, but the general principles that we find in the book of Leviticus are very helpful for the New Testament church. We see in Leviticus how Israel was to fulfill her calling as a nation of priests. They were a nation of of priests and then in the New Testament the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a holy priesthood right is a, a chosen generation in the book of Exodus we see God redeeming a people and in the book of Leviticus we see God sanctifying a people the theme of the atonement is mentioned 43 times and holiness is mentioned 77 times it is in Leviticus where we have that famous quotation that the New Testament writers repeat and quote, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Leviticus is a book full of types and pictures that point to New Testament realities. Sacrifices, ceremonial laws, uh, feasts, and other Hebrew holy days point to the fulfillment, the substance of those things in the New Testament. Here's an outline for the book of Leviticus. One, the offerings, chapters 1 through 7. Two, the institution of the Aaronic priesthood, chapters 8 through 10. Three, cleanliness laws, chapters 11 through 15. Four, the Day of Atonement, chapter 16. Five, various holiness codes, chapters 17 through 22. Six, the Sabbath and the Hebrew calendar, chapter 23, and seven miscellaneous items, chapters 24 through 27, uh, dealing with the showbread and uh, different things pertaining to the tabernacle and just some miscellaneous items. Fourthly, we have Numbers, the book of Numbers. Numbers gets its name 
uh, from the lengthy genealogies of chapters 1 and chapters 26. Uh, the nation of Israel was numbered at Mount Sinai, and it was also numbered in the plains of Moab. Uh, friends, do not skip over these genealogies when you're reading through your Bible. I remember I was at an expository preaching seminar uh, a few years ago, and uh, there was a, a professor there who was uh, on staff at Southern Seminary, and he gave an entire lecture on how to expositorily preach the 36th chapter of Genesis. I don't know if you've ever seen 36th chapter of Genesis, but it is a chapter that's just one long big genealogy. And you might come to a chapter like that and think, well, certainly there's nothing in there for me to preach. And uh, that professor was drawing out all sorts of things. It made me want to go home and preach Genesis 36. So read these genealogies. They're very important, and the New Testament draws upon them uh, to prove various claims made in the Bible. Some major themes in the book of Numbers. The necessity of faith in following the Lord. It was in the book of Numbers where we see the account of the unbelieving Israelites who didn't inherit the land because of their unbelief. If we're going to serve God, if we're going to do a work for Christ, we must do it in faith. Again, we see divine discipline in the book of Numbers. Yes, God is gracious, but He is also just. We see God's provision for His people despite their disobedience. Remember the manna, remember the quail that God provided, remember the rock that God provided to feed and strengthen and nourish His people. Of course, the key event in the book of Numbers is that 40 years of wandering in the desert. That 40 years of wandering in the desert. And this is what the book of Numbers primarily addresses, and it's also the main setting for the book of Numbers, is that wilderness journey. Important characters in the book of Numbers include Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Caleb, and Balak. An outline for the book of Numbers. Number one, Israel numbered at Sinai. Number two, Israel journeys to Kadesh. Uh, let me give you the, the chapter and verse there. Israel numbered at Sinai, number one, chapters one through chapter 10 and verse 10. Two, Israel journeys to Kadesh, chapter 10 verse 11 through the end of chapter 14. Three, Israel wanders in the wilderness, chapters 15 through 21. Four, the story of Balaam. Uh, that's an a, a interesting story in the Bible to read there. Chapters 22 through 24, the, the story of Balaam. Five, Israel on the plains of Moab, chapters 25 through 36. And lastly, we have the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy is perhaps one of the most important Old Testament books that hinges on the New Testament. The New Testament writers make frequent use of Deuteronomy. Jesus, when tempted of the devil, quoted Deuteronomy uh, to Satan there in his temptation. Deuteronomy comes from the Septuagint, and it means the second giving of the law. It originates from the Greek word duo, duo which means two, and nomos, which means law. Duo nomos, two law, second law. Now, it's not a reference to another law, though. It's, it's the same law of Moses, but it's the second giving of the Mosaic law. Why would it have to be given again? Because there was a new generation. Yeah, in the book of Numbers, we see you know, that old generation dying out because of their unbelief. So now we have this second generation, right? And uh, they need to hear the law of God again. Deuteronomy also has Mosaic authorship, just like the rest of the Pentateuch, except for the last chapter, which records the death of Moses. Most uh, scholars believe that Joshua is probably the one that wrote that last chapter. It would be pretty hard for Moses to do it, uh, considering he was dead. Uh, but it purports the death of Moses and also the succession of Joshua, who will then take over as the leader of Israel. So major themes in Deuteronomy. The second giving of the law 
to the new generation of Israel before they inherited the promised land. That is really what Deuteronomy is all about. And it records there Moses' last words and the sermons of Moses there to, um, there to Israel in the plains of Moab. You'll remember what they call the Shema in uh, Deuteronomy. That's in Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 is a very important portion of Scripture for the Old Testament Hebrew. That's where uh, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine head. And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee the great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and the houses full of all gold things. And it, so it goes on and on. And what uh, is going on there in Deuteronomy 6 is Moses is reminding them of some things they already knew, and he's also preparing them for when they will inherit the land. The law was not given once they were in the land, but before they were in the land, and they were to apply a lot of those particulars once they inherited the land that was covenanted unto Abraham. Uh, Moses reaffirmed Jehovah's standards for the conduct of his chosen people. And there's a very important spiritual lesson which we'll see again in, in the scripture, but that is this. Uh, we need to understand the principles of God, the laws of God, if we are to live in the presence of God. Um, it's also interesting to those who want to say that the Old Testament is obsolete, is outdated, that the, uh, some in our day, unfortunately, are even saying things to the effect of the law of God has no place in the life of the Christian. And we need to unhitch the Old Testament from our New Testament faith. Well, it's interesting that when Jesus was asked what the two greatest commandments were, he quoted laws from the Old Testament. Love the Lord thy God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's actually found in Leviticus. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he said that all godliness and righteousness was encompassed in those two commandments. Isn't that something? We see the demonstration of God's love in giving the law. Have you ever thought about that? Most of the time we think that, well, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. And we think that that law that was given by Moses was this awful, uh, harsh, and cruel thing that God did to us. Well, you that have children of your own, you understand that it's only loving to lay down some house rules and to discipline them and to train them. And that's what God did. What would have been unloving was for God to allow them to just wander on in the wilderness and live however they jolly well please. But God intervened and gave them his law. And the law of Moses is a gracious law. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that the covenant that God entered into with Moses was a gracious covenant. God revealing himself through his law, ministry and administration of that gracious covenant that God made with his people. Of course, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. There was still yet a better covenant. And there is a new covenant that supersedes and it is the covenant for God's people. But we must understand that there are principles and precepts in that old covenant that Jesus brings into the new. right? And, and therefore, we must understand there's a great deal of continuity there. And uh, really, the only discontinuity is when we find explicit abrogations in the New Testament. So understand that the law is not something that we as the Lord's people uh, should be afraid of or should try to distance ourselves from. I, I hear this all the time where people say, well, we're under grace, not under the law. And what they mean there is that we're not obligated to keep the law of God. Somehow we're under some new stipulation of grace. And that is not what that verse is teaching at all. What Paul is teaching there in the book of Romans is that we as the Lord's people are no longer under the penalty of the law. 
The law is no longer condemning us, but we're under grace. Because he goes on in Romans 3 and he says, Do we then make void the law by faith? No, we establish the law. So we need to quit looking at the law of God like a rebellious teenager looks at the rules of his parents. And we need to understand that God's given us his law, Old Testament and New Testament, for our good. And we should say with the psalmist, How love I thy law. And we should say with Paul, that I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So, we went down a rabbit trail there, but I think it's okay as long as we kill the rabbit. But those are some major themes in the book of Deuteronomy. The law of God is very prominent there, and we see a lot of general equitable principles that apply even for the New Testament believer. Let me give you quickly an outline for the book of Deuteronomy. Number one, a preliminary address from chapter 1 to chapter 4, uh, no, no ch chapter 1, verses 4, chapter 1 through chapter 4 and verse 43. Chapter 1 through chapter 4 and verse 43, a preliminary address. Secondly, an exposition of the law. It's two, an exposition of the law. Chapter 4, verses 44 through chapter 26. Three, the promises of the law, the blessings and cursings of the law, the promises of the law. Chapters 26 and 27. Four, Moses' final words, chapters 29 through chapter 33. And fifthly, the death of Moses and the succession of Joshua, chapter 34. All right, well, I believe we're off to a good start here at the overview of the scriptures. These were the five books known as the Pentateuch. God bless you and thank you.